know, celebrating black excellence, which we should do every day, every month. For those of you who don't know, he's Augustus Clark. They call him Gussie. He's a reggae producer who has worked with some of the top Jamaican reggae artists from in the 1970s, later set up his own music studio. And he's with me now. Um, gave me this compilation of music that he produced and stuff that I, I still listen to almost every day. But he's going to discuss his contribution to our music industry. Um, but I've asked him a question before we go that. Morning, my friend. Good to see you. That's one. All is well. All is well. Can't complain. Could always do worse. Yeah. I will read something here. In his second year at Kingston College, Gussie developed the daily habit of arriving at school very early so that he could maximize the revenue from a business he innovated, selling rides on his bicycle. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> a big business that, 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 in those days. Well, we had to start somewhere, Papa. <laughs> yeah. So when did this music thing start with you? Actually, no. It started from I was going to school. It was the one thing I knew I wanted to do. I just love music. So I started in many areas, you know, saving your lunch money, buy parts, amplifier, make amplifier, swap it with it, your transformer, swap it, amplifier, fair, really with your adult device, you write on it, big youth, and it just went on and on and about. But where did the love of music start and it was like you didn't want to sing because you say you talk about amplifier and all kind of stuff so where did that come from at all your family your, your, where you where you get it from i think socialization downtown it was an era where you know dub and sound system was evolving and the music was expanding internationally so it was kind of like you know you get a you get a vaccine we say moving in that direction before the virus reach you yeah. i actually, i actually tried I'm um, doing electrical work and when the first day I went to mask with a chip out some wall block, some holes in the wall and tell him, can I mark it? And so the laser this I like printry. Went to time sprint and started the first week when after the first week when they get paid them take out three days and keep at the bank I had to keep a deposit. I didn't like that, so I just went back to what I loved and it worked. And yeah. the beautiful thing is I was supported. So if most parents recognize what their children want guide them, support them. At the end of the day, they quite likely will become, you know, worthy and are successful if they truly are what it is. Yep. So your first foray officially in music was what? As a selector, producer, singer? What was the first, first thing you did? My first foray was having a little sound system downtown called King of CI5. Then I started, bought a dub machine from Treasure Island and started putting dubs. Then I started importing foreign records and selling all the soul sound. As you know, in those years, we call them soul sound, the Gemini and the stamp and the soul tone them. Yeah. And then I started, I was doing so good a job at it that people from abroad come put up dubs from foreign. Then times they have eight track, and when you have eight track, they really make on one track, the voice on another. So I could remove the track and create unique versions that gave sound system advantage. So I went to the dub cutting. Then I went into importing records and I went into exporting records to people all abroad. So, for example, a Jamaican record producer who will put out a record, him don't have the money to, um, you know, finance it. So I'll finance that printing of the first 500, buy it exclusively, import it to our piece records in New York and beat everybody to it. So it's, entrepreneurship was in the blood all along. Then I believe I could contribute because basically I'm all is naturally a creative person, I think, both in business and in music. So I believe that I could make some, you know, creative contribution in music and, you know, something that really man moving on and deciding what okay, we'll build a studio. I would build a studio where we could even build a studio and turn the bathroom into a vocal room and use the lady bathroom downstairs. But it was an opportunity, the timing was good. Yeah, yeah. First um, artist you produced? First artist was you, Ryan. You, Ryan? That, Daddy Roy. It was a song called The Eye of the Mountain. Yeah, so how oh, you get that? Because he was, he was just coming in at the time or he, he, he had already he, made his name? He was pretty much established, but I guess he liked the rhythm, he liked the proposal, and it worked. And he's really one of the most decent artists he ever went on with a problem. It, so it was simple. Then after that, I went to Big Youth, and we did the whole Screaming Target project, you know? Yeah, but you, you, put, 
they produce some big big man though. Cause when you produce Dennis Brown and Gregory Isaacs and those people too. Axi Priest, Jimmy Cliff, Buta Baruch, Aini, Kamuzi, Gregory Isaac. Then the only question is probably who have I not produced? Might yeah. be a better question. I, I, I was also reading and it says you were perhaps the first Jamaican producer to issue regular royalty statements to artists. Well, I have always done and tried to do my best, but sometimes the embers of untruth is even worse than the fire of truth. So although we have done all of that, you know, you still will have artists. One of the things you have to, a producer have to understand about this business is that um, perception is some people's reality. So although you're doing all that and tons of innovation, an artist doing a song 20 years ago don't mean you're entitled to anything. You're doing a hundred songs don't mean you're entitled to any money so if you don't get it, somebody keep you. Or if you're black and you're Jamaican, right? What is important is how well did this record do? What are you entitled to? And one out of ten records might be successful. Record producers, they can be beaten, lose them house money, and some lose our relationship. And at the end of the day, people blaming that they are a thief. But you know what is weird? An artist would say a producer is a thief. So my question is, when that artist produce, so another artist, what is he you know? Is he also a thief? A. B. Artists have so much income source that revenue arising from a production. Nobody talks about. I make each record you make it as value to your career, to the artist's career. But when the artist go into the stage show, record producer don't get money. When in the dub plays and special, thousands in some cases, hundreds and thousands, nobody gets anything. But if they don't get royalty of a, of a record which might be a failure, you might hear as a thief. So it's a whole lot of perceptions that are far from reality. Yeah. You told me about the first artist you produced, the biggest song you produced, whether by sales or popularity. Um, what was that? The biggest song I think I've ever produced is um, Champion Lover by Deborah Glasgow out in the UK. And from Champion Lover, Shabba came in and we had him do Mr. Loverman, which is the biggest song he has ever done in his life. I have had a good team of people around me, the Mikey Bennett, the Walter Linda, the Dean Frazers. So I chose people who were exceptionally good in what they do. And none of them has complained today. Yeah. Final question, my friend. What are you doing now? No, I am looking at creating a, um, a pitch that's called Pitchworks. What Pitchworks basically is, is looking at the upcoming young talent and giving creative space to work and hopefully that they can, you know, evolve and become very successful. Just like how we have looked at things, things like, for example, we innovated the, the GACAP. We were the first set of founding members. We innovated jams with mentor important people who are successful, like a specialist, Dylan, a Donovan, Jeremy, and a smart kid, a Gavin Brown. So we are giving back to all of the young people because for us to go further, it has to be a merging of the knowledge, the wisdom, understanding of those of us who have seemingly not become certified failures in the past to see if we can have this kind of value to the current set of people coming up. Fantastic. I think you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, the embers of untruth are worse than the fire of truth. Is that what you said? Yeah, man. That's because a, we, that's yeah, and I'll give you a quick I'll give you a quick example. In 1972, approximately, we created the Screaming Target album by Big U, and it has worked well. Since then, there was a misunderstanding on his part and he felt that I was claiming things that don't belong to him. Didn't know. And every interview him walk and him talk about it, I knew nothing about it. And when I confronted him, at the end of the day, I solved it for him 40 years after. Him don't backtrack and tell everybody I was wrong in it. So these things happen every day in the business, man. Yeah. And congrats on your national award too, sir. Should have said that and up I, front. I thank you, sir. I lose a continue. You, 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 uh, you deserve it. Um, uh, there you go. Being uh, awarded by our Governor General, Augustus Gossie Clark. Great to have a chat with you. I thank you again for uh, the compilation that you, you presented to me. I still listen to it. Some wonderful um, productions uh, by you. And look after yourself and continue to do what you've done for so many years. All right, sir? And, and thank you, too, sir. You still have the bicycle with you. I charge people for riding. A school, man. <laughs> you know, your problem is, you need it. You have to spend some money with me. You didn't, you know. Don't have it. <laughs> Gossie, good to see you. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Yeah, man. Okay, God bless. Man. Augustus Clark, record producer, music publisher.
music executive and from your heard in that interview uh, so much more.